Go to Romans 6 again. And we read the whole chapter for our scripture reading. And I'm going to start off in the message here with two verses, but we'll look at some other verses along the way. Not only in Romans 6, but in a lot of other places also. So make sure when you come here, you bring your Bible and you keep it open and uh, receive the Word of God attentively and receptively. What a wonderful blessing to have the pure Word of God. In Romans 6, verse 14 and 15, the Scripture says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now, we've considered these verses in context many times before. Uh, Romans 6 is one of my favorite chapters. It's a key chapter on the Christian life, and we've looked at it a number of times. Uh, but this morning, we're going to focus in on what it means to be under grace. We talk a lot about this. We rejoice that we're not under the law, but under grace. But what does it really mean to be under grace? You know what grace is. God's favor and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's His gift. It's not based on who we are and what we do. It's based on God and His goodness. But what does it mean to be under grace? Uh, that statement, we're not under the law, but under grace, is actually only found twice in the Bible. And it's in these two verses. Paul's the only one in the Word of God who says that, writing for this present age in which we're living. Now, we're going to develop this later in the message, but I want to say up front that to be under something, if you check the dictionary, there are a lot of definitions for it. It depends on how it's being used in a sentence. But there are three things in particular, I think, that goes along with what Paul's saying here. To be under something is to be in a state of indebtedness. It is to be in a state of tutelage. You're to learn when you're under a teacher. Um, a state of governance. It's the authority over you. It governs your actions. There are many today who have much to say about being under grace, but don't seem to really live like they are actually in their practical walk. It's one thing to say you're under grace, something else to act like it. <laughs> the grace of God not only delivers us from the penalty of sin, but from the power of it. Now, now, that's what Romans 6 is talking about, being made free from the power of sin in our daily walk. Not talking about just when we get to heaven. Obviously, we won't ever sin once we're there. But now, in our daily walk, the grace of God delivers us from the power of sin. So the grace of God not only provides salvation, but it enables us in sanctification, in our service to the Lord, in our sufferings. It keeps us eternally secure. There's a lot of things the Bible says the grace of God does. No wonder it's called the manifold grace of God. It's many faceted, has many applications. Now, there was nothing wrong with the law. Okay, the law was not evil. The law was not bad. You hear people talk about the law as though something was wrong with it. There wasn't anything wrong with it at all. It was just an inferior system to grace. The reason being the weakness of the flesh. The problem was not the law of God. It was the flesh of man. Paul said in Romans 7 that the law was actually holy and just and good. Just couldn't make us holy, just, and good. Look in Romans 7, begin in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? The way some people preach today, you would almost think that they think that way. What, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So that was the purpose 
to show us we're sinners. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, notice in the singular, and he's talking here in the context of sin as a nature. Sin as a nature is the root of which sins and our conduct are the fruit. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. And I believe he's talking about when he was in innocency before a condition of accountability. But when the commandment came, he know good from evil and willfully chose the evil. When the commandment came, sin revived. It was there the whole time in the flesh. Sin has a nature. And I died. Where all lost sinners are dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritually. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, that's the culprit, that's the problem. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding Sinful, you put the flesh under the law, and sin will have dominion over you. So the only way to live righteously is gonna it's gonna take the grace of God to live consistently a righteous life by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God. Verse 14: For we know that the law is spiritual, but I, talking about the flesh. Uh, the sinful nature, I'm carnal, sold under sin. That flesh is sold under it. So you see the problem is the flesh. Look in chapter 8. Romans 8, therefore, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now that is a descriptive clause there, not a conditional because in verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All believers walk after the Spirit. Okay, not always like we ought, but nonetheless, that's true of all believers. And so read on, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that... Now here's the problem. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. You see that? The problem's the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now notice verse 4. That. Why did He do that? The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Keep that in mind. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the law had a purpose, and it served its purpose. It was a schoolmaster. But now God has brought us under something better. Look in Galatians 3. I realized that Gentiles were not under the law in the sense of the covenant, but if the Jews couldn't keep it, obviously nobody else was because that they rep in other words, the problem is the flesh, and the flesh is the same whether it be Jew or Gentile. And so although we were not under the covenant of law, it still condemned us. Romans 3 makes that clear. By the law is the knowledge of sin, and all are guilty. The, the whole world is guilty, and their mouth is stopped. Galatians 3.22, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Must be a living book to draw a conclusion. <laughs> that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, this faith of Christ by which we're justified in the age of grace, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. I mean, it had a purpose, but now we're under something better. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ by one spirit and one body, of course, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, so on the spiritual one body 
of Christ. Now, what is the fundamental difference between law and grace? He said, we're not under the law, but we are under grace. What, what is the difference? Well, it's the difference between performance and gift. Under the law, the Word of God said, do this and be blessed. Don't do this, you'll be cursed. You had to perform. You had to prove your faith by your works. You had to do some things. Look in Exodus 19. I can show you so many verses, but I'll give you this one. It ought to be sufficient. It's clear as day. Right when God's about to bring them under the covenant of the law, notice what he says to them. In Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. See the if? That's what law is. You, the law verses in the Bible are always if, then. If you do this, then I'll do that. It's a performance. You have to do some things. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then... You shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. But you go to Titus 2, or go there a little bit later, so I won't turn there now. He said we are a peculiar people because of the cross of Christ, because of the grace of God. Here you'll be a special treasure to me. You'll be my people if, if. There was a... There was a an issue there of them having to perform. They had to do some things. However, under grace, it's already done. There's nothing to do but rest in what's been done. You're accepted in the beloved and complete in Christ the moment you simply believe. It's the free gift. And Paul actually used that phrase, free gift, regarding salvation. In Romans 5, he emphasized throughout his epistles, it's the gift of God. The law said, do and be blessed, but grace says, you are blessed, now do. What a difference. And a good passage on do and be blessed would be Deuteronomy 28. Do all these things, and then I will bless you with all these material blessings in the land. But Ephesians 1.3 said, he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What a contrast. The law required righteousness, but grace makes us righteous. Okay? The law gave works for a man to do, but grace gave words for a man to believe. Now, obviously God knew the people could not keep His law. That's why He gave them sacrifices to cover those sins. But they had to bring those sacrifices. But there's nothing for us to do but believe the Word of God, the message of grace. The law cursed sinners, but grace justifies sinners. The law had a ministration of death, but grace a ministration of life. The law is about religion, but grace about a relationship with God. And on it goes, there is a difference between law and grace. Now, God did not put us under grace because he decided to lower or even eliminate his standard of righteousness. That wasn't the purpose at all. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever, God doesn't change his moral standards. God doesn't change his righteousness. He changes in his dealings with man, yes, but not when it comes to, listen, the righteousness of God, bringing in grace was not to say, okay, righteousness doesn't matter anymore. We're under grace. He did not put us under grace to eliminate righteousness. He put us under grace to enable us by His Spirit to live righteously in Christ Jesus. Remember, he said in Romans 8, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, obviously we're not under the ceremonial ordinances. We're not under certain things 
that were taken away by the cross, but I guarantee you that the moral commandments of God are just as binding in this age as they ever were because Paul himself made it very clear. He taught nine out of the Ten Commandments. The only commandment of the ten that we're not under is the issue of the Sabbath because that was a sign between God and Israel. Grace is not liberty to sin. It is liberty from sin. Being under grace does not lower the standard of living. It actually raises it. That's why Paul said, Having therefore, beloved, these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's uh, not just a matter of going through the motions and doing some things, although under the law God wanted to see their heart be right also, no doubt about it. But I'm saying is that uh, it, it is an issue of being right with God from the inside out, and there is no hint whatsoever when you hit Paul's epistles that now that we're under grace, we can just be lax when it comes to how we live. You know what? Listen carefully, please. I, I think that all of you in here agree with me on this. But we need to, this needs to be something we really fully grasp and, and understand. There are many today who, while they talk much about being under grace, they instead act like they're trying to make grace be under them. In other words, the purpose of grace is to be subservient to their carnal nature. Instead of being under grace, they're trying to make grace be under them. That the reason God put them under grace is so that they could do what they wanted to do without penalty and without consequence. There are people, you may say, well, nobody's like that. There are people like that. And that's dangerous. Jude, and I understand the context of it, but I also understand it still applies today where he warned about false teachers who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Well, the grace of God uh, is freedom to live for your lusts. That's not it at all. Well, guess what? What I'm about to preach and what, I've, what I'm preaching in this message, I guarantee you in some circles will get me labeled as a legalist. That's fine because I, I, I find that a lot of people don't even know what that is. There are some people who, who if, you, if you have any standard of living, any practical righteousness, if, you, if any preacher exhorts God's people to some practical righteousness in their conduct, oh, you're a legalist. You expect me to go to church, you legalist? You expect me to, you, and, and on down the line you can go with it. I say you ought not to listen to filthy, vile music of this world system because it's against God and does not glorify God. Oh, you're a legalist. Nothing of the sort, my friend. Do you know what a legalist is? It's one who says you must do works to be right with God. In other words, you're earning God's favor. You're earning uh, God's acceptance. And I don't believe that at all. You can't earn anything. It's God's grace. But what does the grace of God do in someone? Paul is crystal clear on this. There are a lot of preachers that I think that are misrepresenting the Apostle Paul. Um, you know what? Look in 2 Corinthians 4. If you haven't fallen into this trap, thank God, but I'm warning you right now not to fall in it. This is a message that needs to be preached, I think, for our own church, but also for those out there who are abusing the grace of God and taking it in vain. Second Corinthians 4, you know what? The grace of God is not about you. The grace of God is not about me. It's about the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 15. 
for all things or for your sakes in terms of ministry, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many, what is it going to do? Redound to the glory of God. I mean, that's what it's all about. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do to all the glory of God. God didn't put us under grace so we'll have this freedom to do what our carnal nature desires at any time. No responsibility, no accountability, I'm free. No, you're under bondage of your flesh. If you live like that, you're not really free. Now, here's the thing. What, go back to Romans 6. What is the whole theme of the chapter? The whole thing is about how God made us free from sin. Because he took us out of the flesh and put us in the body of Christ. And now we no longer have to live under the dominion of sin. We don't have to be under sin's bondage. And I'm talking about in this life. I'm not talking about eradication of the sin nature. Uh, you're going to have that sin nature with you until death of the rapture. But you don't have to live as a servant to it. You're supposed to live as a servant to God. Notice what he said, by the way, before we even hit chapter 6, look at the end of chapter 5. Watch this. Chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Because putting people's flesh under the law breeds rebellion because of the flesh. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thank God for that. Grace that is greater than all our sin. That, notice... As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. We want to enjoy that, right? What is the reign of grace? To enthrone the grace of God in your life. To, to the reign of grace. What does that look like? Here it is. So that uh, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The grace is not separate from righteousness. It enables righteousness. Chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul knew that the carnal mind would surmise such a thing. He said, God forbid. I mean, how many times does he say that in Romans? That's a very strong term. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he explains how we're dead to sin. He said, you need to know this. You're baptized into Christ. By one spirit, we are baptized or crucified with him, buried with him, raised with him. We can walk in newness of life. He goes on to say, reckon it so in your heart and then yield your members and live it out in your life. Key words in Romans 6, no, reckon and yield. You can't reckon what you don't know. And you won't yield if you don't reckon. And to reckon is a, is a word of faith. It's not emotion. You don't feel dead to sin. You reckon it by faith. Look in verse 17. But God be thanked that you were, past tense, the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart. What are you doing talking about obedience, Paul? Don't you know this is grace? Don't you know that you don't have to obey? There are no commandments to obey under grace. Paul didn't get that memo, though, did he? He said, the things I write on you are the commandments of the Lord. He said, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So it starts with doctrine. You believe it in your heart. You obey it in your life. Now, that is to know the doctrine, reckon it in your heart, Yielded in, obe yielded in obedience. That is spirit, soul, and body. Know it in your spirit. Reckon it in your heart. Live it out in your body. Oh, did you know that we are to be holy in our body? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul said in Romans 12, holy. Except, you know, people act like holiness is some floating mystical thing that you just can't quite see or... No, it's it's first thing in this Bible that was called holy is dirt. You're on holy ground. Well, your body is made out of dirt. Remember that next time you get a little proud of yourself. But it's holy ground because God lives in you. It belongs to God. 
Now, look in Romans 6, verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. You don't have to live under the bondage of the sin nature. That's not the normal Christian life. That's not what God has for us. He has something far greater. People go to Romans 7 and totally misinterpret the passage and what Paul is saying there to try to act like the normal Christian life is I want to do right but can't. That's not what he's saying in Romans 7. I don't have time to develop that. On our website, I have a whole message going through Romans 7 verse by verse. I will show you that same principle in Galatians 5 a little bit later. That, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believeth, why would he say, you know what? This gospel is so wonderful. You, you'll get saved and then you'll want to do right, but you just can't. No, it's a gospel that will save your soul and it will sanctify your life and one day will glorify your body. Romans chapter 6, verse number 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, see we're crucified with him through being baptized by one spirit into his body. We believe that we shall also live with him. And... Um, Let's read on down. I'm trying to look at what all I want to cover. I don't want to read the whole chapter. We already did that far as Scripture reading, but um, skip down to verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let, no, no, notice this. This is our choice. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It's up to you. You say, well, it's not my fault. Yes, it is. When we sin, it is our fault. And you don't have to commit that sin when you're tempted with it. There's a Spirit of God in you that will enable you to defeat that temptation if you yield to Him. In any get, Look, one of my points is this. We all mess up, I understand. But in any given situation, there's no excuse. God put His Spirit in you so that you could obey Him. He said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But on the other hand, this is what you need to do. Yield yourself. Look at the verses. Yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made. How many times has he said this? He says this three times. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. That's what the grace of God is for. The grace of God is not to be your servant. The grace of God is not given to us so that we'll have an alibi for being worldly and carnal. The grace of God is given to us to make us a servant of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Carnal people have a hard time with this. He said, let me make it so basic, a little child can get it. As you've yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. That's what you did in the past. Even so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. He said, it's up to you. It's a, it's a, God's done what he's going to do. This is, it's up to you if you're going to follow this. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? That's a work of grace. There are th look, there were things I did before I was saved that I wasn't ashamed at all. I enjoyed it. That looking back now, I'm so deeply ashamed. I wouldn't want to mention it. I don't know about these people who, when they talk about salvation, they brag about their sinfulness and they act like, you know, and the wonderful thing is I'm going to heaven, but you ought to be ashamed of sin. The end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin. There it is again. <laughs> you become, what's the purpose of grace? You become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness. 
in the everlasting life. It's the gift of God, because he goes on to say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But there is a practical outworking now. Most people think, you know what, I prayed the prayer, I'm on my way to heaven, and uh, salvation is about going to heaven when you die. That's not what it's about. Yeah, you're going to heaven if you're saved, but that's not the purpose of salvation, you going to heaven. You show me that verse in the Bible, would you? The purpose is the glory of God, where he's going to make a people conform to the image of Jesus Christ. He wants to get glory out of your life now. So living under grace is living the Christ life. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's what grace does. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said in the same epistle in Galatians 4.19 that he was travailing and, and laboring in his ministry to churches of Galatia to see Christ formed in them. Christ is in you if you're saved, but he needs to be formed in you in your practical life. Listen, God is conforming you to the image of Christ. So if you're under grace, you know how you're going to live? Like Jesus Christ. Now, nobody's arrived, have they? But isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal? And didn't Paul say, I press toward the mark? I know the prize of the high calling of God is to be conformed to His image. I have not yet apprehended, but I'm pressing toward it. Now, look in Romans 8, please. So, just to follow up, and you know, I'm not going to develop this in detail. This is going to point out the verses. But the, the, to be under something is to be in a state of indebtedness. Well, that fits with the Word of God. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. You're dead to that. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. In other words, you treat it as dead because you are crucified with Christ. So if you're not debtors to the flesh, what are you a debtor to? The Spirit of God, the grace of God. Being under grace does not free us from responsibility. You're a debtor. You're a debtor to the Spirit. You're a debtor to all men to give them the gospel. That's what Paul said, I'm a debtor in Romans 1. He said he was a debtor concerning getting the gospel to all men. And then he said he was a debtor in the sense of loving others in Romans 13. You're a debt. Being under grace does not free you from responsibility before God. Look in Titus 2. Being under grace does not excuse ignorance. You can learn what it means to live the Christian life and you can actually do it. And you can run to Romans 7 all you want to. That's no alibi for you. The, his experience in Romans 7 is the experience of a man who's trying to be righteous by the law. That's where it'll lead you. His whole point in the content, and this is the thing, is that, and I'm not claiming I'm some great teacher, but what I am so concerned about is the way people isolate verses and preach without any context to what they're saying. When Paul wrote an epistle, it wasn't a collection of little sayings. Everything has a context that flows. And you're not prepared to interpret and understand Romans 7 until you understand what's going on leading up to Romans 7, starting in chapter 1. Well, uh, Titus 2, verse 11, so clear, so clear. For the grace of God, bring us salvation, hath appeared to all men. And this grace message came down with the appearance of Christ to Saul of Tarsus and that glorious appearing, teaching us what is it going to teach us? See, the law commanded righteousness but never taught anybody how to do it. The grace of God will teach you to do what? Look at the verses. This is not my opinion. This is not me being a legalist, you know. I think if Paul was preaching today, they'd call him one because there are people who act like if you preach any kind of practical righteous conduct, then you are just putting people under the law. That's nonsense. 
I know none of you are like that. There's a lot of people that have that attitude. It's unfortunate. He said, Deny, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. I, I hear grace believers, as they call themselves, brag about their worldly lusts. I heard it just recently from a preacher that is well known and I respect as a Bible teacher, but it blew my mind what he was condoning. It was borderline antinomian. I mean, he, I don't think he's that. Then that means he's this mindset that it's, there's no law. Paul was quick to say it's not the law of Moses, but you live in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There is a standard of conduct. There is a structure to the Christian life. There is responsibility. There is accountability. There is, you are God's servant. He is not yours. You are under grace. Quit trying to make grace be under you. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Yeah, so many believers, professing believers, seem to take the Christian life so flippantly, so lightly, righteously, and godly when we all get to heaven. No, he said, in this present world now, that's separation. You're denying the wrong things and you're going in the right direction. Looking for that blessed hope. This is the motivation and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us so that we can go to heaven. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself <clears throat> a peculiar people zealous of good works, Oh, I'm under grace, so don't expect me to do anything in the work of the ministry. Bless God, because I'm under grace. Well, yeah, you're just as complete as I am or anybody else. That's your standing, but your state needs to start lining up with your standing. And that's why Paul rebuked the Corinthians the way that he did. is because he reminded them in the beginning of the epistle to, to uh, 1 Corinthians, you have the standing in grace, but you're not acting like it. And he rebukes them all through the letter the goal of spiritual growth is getting your state lined up with your standing. Verse 15, it's almost like Paul knew that people would bristle at this, so he said, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. <laughs> Let no man despise thee. Implication is there will be some who do. Tell me how to live. I'm not telling you how to live. God is. I'm just reading the book. So, being under grace means you're, you're, it's tutoring you, it's teaching you things about how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and how to live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's what being under grace looks like. One more. Look, please, in 1 Corinthians 15. Being under grace is in a state of governance. You know, there's one verse where Paul mentions the grace of God three times. Three, and look, nobody says more about the grace of God than Paul. He mentions it about a hundred times in 13 epistles. And he uses those wonderful superlatives like exceeding and abundant and abounding and all of this. So, um, and here he uses the word three times in one verse. And look what it did for him. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Now, in 2 Corinthians 6, he told uh, the church at Corinth, Receive not the grace of God in vain. Well, how do you know you haven't received it in vain? Well, what did it do for Paul? He said, His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. How about that? He didn't do less. You got people who do less in serving God under grace than they did when they were under the law. 
You wonder about the motive of such people. When they're under a preacher who, who's trying to scare them to death half the time, you don't do right, God's going to kill you. Amen. I mean, that kind of preaching really gets people moving. But it's not right. And then you show them it's not right, and they're like, whoo, all right. I don't have to do nothing now. And it's like the flesh is one extreme of the other, isn't it? He said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. It wasn't me doing it. What was it? The legalism, which was with me. <laughs> no, he said, it's the grace of God, which was with me. Now, is Paul our pattern? Is Paul our spokesman? Is Paul our example? Well, yes. So that's how it, it needs to work in us, too. And I'm not going to run all these references because of time. We're about out of time as always. But here, here, here's some references. You ought to jot these down and check them out. You know, for an example, when you're under the governance of grace, you know one of the things that, one of the ways it shows up practically is it makes you a giver. Why don't you check 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and see how many times he called giving a grace. All right. Boy, there's so many verses to look at. Galatians, do turn here. I, I forgot. I need to show you this. Galatians 5. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm going to preach it anyway. Okay. <laughs> Galatians 5. You, look, look, I, I can't say it all, but you, check, go home today and read all of Paul's epistles and mark how many times he talks like this, my friend. This is constant. All right, so you can say you're following Paul all you want to, but saying it's one thing and acting like it's another. In and, 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 uh, Galatians 5, verse 16, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Why couldn't they do the things they would? Because they were putting themselves under the law. That was the problem in Galatia. So what does he say? But... If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. He said, as long as you're trying to put yourself in the law, sin shall have dominion over you. Okay, and it's not the law, it's the flesh. But if you will be led of the Spirit to put all your confidence in Christ and who you are in the body of Christ, and you'll quit trying to earn God's favor and you'll rest in who you are in Christ, then that's something else. You're not under the law if you're led of the Spirit and He enumerates the works of the flesh and warns strongly against that, and goes on to say the fruit of the Spirit, and he gives nine wonderful things that gives us a, a moral portrait of Jesus Christ. And he's saying this ought to be formed in you, the fruit of the Spirit. What does it look like to live under grace? Read the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it ought to look like. Okay, so I'm not even going to turn here, but Ephesians 2 he said, you were dead in sins. You walked according to the course of this world. Uh, you had the, the spirit of Satan, basically, he says, in you. And yet God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. He talked about how he quickened us together. By grace you're saved. And he, and he gives us that wonderful verse, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. But that's not the end of what he says, because he says right after that, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So being under grace is not freedom from authority. You say, I'm under grace, bless God. All right, what does that mean? Are you really under it, practically speaking? Now, you are dispensationally, but I'm saying practically. Are you really under it? Okay, then you're indebted to it. You can never repay God, but you need to understand the debt of, I am not a debtor to the flesh, but to the Spirit. Paul said that in Romans 8. Then you are under the tutelage of it. You're learning in submission what it's trying to teach you. And what it's trying to teach you is to stop being worldly and carnal and ungodly and start living righteously and godly. That's what it's trying to teach you. And you're under the governance. You're not... So being under grace does not free us from responsibility. We're indebted. It does not excuse ignorance. We're under the tutelage of it. And it's not being freed from authority because we're under the governance of grace. But guess what? Here's the good news. When you're under God's grace, living by God's word, there's the greatest freedom there is. You will really know freedom when you follow the word of God. 
It's not freedom to give place to your flesh. It will bring you under bondage. Well, I close with this for the third time. And I, I just want you, I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to leave it like this, and you can go home and read it. Okay, I'm going to challenge you. There are some today who actually claim that it is wrong, wrong to preach that the grace of God will produce a changed life. Okay, I'm serious. Well, you show me one verse that says it doesn't, and I'll show you a whole slew of them that says it does. Now, you can't determine somebody's salvation by how they live because it's a gift of God and it's by believing. So you can look at somebody and not really at that moment in time discern only God knows the heart. But what I'm saying is, I'm not telling you to go around saying, well, they're not saved because they're not living right. That's not my point at all. But what my point is, if there ever was a changed life, his name was Saul of Tarsus. Right? You're talking about a change? And he's our pattern and he's our spokesman and then we're going to turn around and say, it's wrong to say change. That's unbelievable, man. Somebody missed the boat somewhere. And I'll give you two passages. I'm closing my Bible. I'm done. Two passages. Just many more I could give you. But you check Colossians 1. Paul hadn't even been to Colossae. See, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> But Paul hadn't even been to Colossae, and he said, but I heard some things about you, and I have confidence you're saved. Why? Because you, you have faith, and you have love, and you have hope. And he said, you know what? The gospel brings forth fruit. He said, it did it in the, since the day you heard of it. Wow. How about the church at Thessalonica, chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 1? He said, you were serving idols. No, no longer now. You're serving God. There's a work of faith, a labor of love, a patience of hope. And he, he talks about how the grace of God changed their life. I like where it says Barnabas went down to Antioch and he saw the grace of God. How do you see the grace of God? By what it did in their life. And it goes on and on and on. I hope you agree. Because if you don't, you're wrong. And you need to get right with the Bible. Okay? Because everything I said this morning is not my opinion. And it's not my interpretation. It's black and white in the scripture. But we need to be a church that needs to be very careful. Because whereas we rejoice in the grace message. And we emphasize the grace of God. There's a balance here. What is the grace of God for? Not to be your servant but to make you a servant of God. And don't go out of here saying that I think that if a person is not living right, they're not saved. That's not what I said at all. What I'm saying is, the, the rule is, the rule is, in general, that somebody gets saved, there's going to be a difference there, and that's just what the Word of God presents in verse after verse after verse. Now, because you have the flesh, it's possible to look like there's not a difference. Somebody cannot live like they're saved and yet be. So you, that's not your, you should never try to judge someone's salvation. That's between them and the Lord. But this is what God intends. This is what God has for us. God said he's extended us this grace to enable us to live righteous, not to eliminate. It's not like God said, you know what? Under the law, I wanted people to do right. But you know, I'm just going to take it easy now. You know, forget all that. I'm going to just take it easy and forget my moral standards of righteousness, and I'm going to put people under grace so they can live just like they're still lost. So, they can, so their families can fall apart, their marriages can fall apart, they can live under substance abuse, they can rot their mind with Hollywood, and they can do all of that because that's my grace. That's why I died on the cross. It's for that. I hope you don't think that nonsense because that ain't right. Let's stand together, please.